night. Uh, thanks everyone again for joining tonight. Kevin Heffernan and Linda Hunt's presentation will be on Pocket Habitats, the 2021 Howard County Butterfly Survey. Kevin is a past president of the Howard County Bird Club and is interested in gardening and encouraging the planting of native pollinator gardens through Bee City. Linda is a master naturalist interested in native pollinator habitat preservation and gardening. Kevin and Linda co-chair the Howard County Bird Club's butterfly group. So please join me in welcoming Kevin and Linda. Good evening, can anybody see me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Kevin, where are we with the uh, PowerPoint? Is that up? I will put it up in a second here. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, Kevin and I are going to do this. I'm in Florida in Palm Beach. You see my iPhone. And he is at home and bringing up the presentation PowerPoint. And this may be a tag team presentation because I'm on an open Wi-Fi network, which has been periodically crashing me off of Zoom meetings in the morning. And so I expect that I will crash and burn at some point here, and then I will sign back in again. And I'm using my phone because the computer has completely crashed using the Wi-Fi here. It just cannot handle it at all. Okay. Um, how did I come up with this uh, idea of pocket habitats? And it really was a combination of things over the years. And I think what set it off was the Xerxes Society had put a thing out on pocket meadows. And I remember down here, I always called the little parks that I went to that had the greatest little hidden treasures in them. I always called pocket parks, even though they weren't very little vacant lots in a big city somewhere. And so I took that and I looked at what we have been doing and decided that I was going to use this old term of pocket instead of a pocket park or a pocket garden, I was going to use it for a pocket habitat. And so we're going to be talking about habitats in relation to the Howard County Sur Butterfly Survey in terms of what we have been seeing. For, I know some of you are new, and so I'm going to do like a little one minute uh, history of where this started. It started in 212, which was like the big year for butterflies. And I remember this year because I was not doing butterflies really. I was just getting started and I had a garden just like a lot of you do. And I wandered into Robinson and I think it was Brian or someone like that who said, oh, you're here to see the butterfly. And I thought, what butterfly? And I had no clue what was going on. I believe the butterfly was the cloudless sulfur, which had made an appearance up here that year and everybody was all excited about it. Well, as a result of that year, which also coincided with people with digital cameras, not having to go through the process that Joe just described to get a picture, but to have it instantly and be able to see it and manipulate it and uh, getting more interested in taking pictures of little things like butterflies. In coordination with that, and I believe that uh, Bob Solem started the website gallery for butterflies right around that time. So people were beginning to get interested in butterflies. So Joe Sue Muller and Dick Smith, who was the resident Mid-Atlantic specialist in butterflies, uh, who was soon, who was uh, died in 2016. They conceived of having a survey with the goals of determining what the status of the butterflies were, uh, who was here, how strong they were in terms of uh, density, etc. And second, to encourage participation in. Uh, learning about butterflies and butterfly conservation. 
So out of this background came the survey as we know it today. So the first year in 2013 was just sort of a trial year and 2014 is actually when we began. So we have now been at it for eight years. Uh, Kevin, you can go ahead. All right, so this is what we're talking about. I'm gonna talk first about what the pocket habitat perspective is. And I'm talking about it as a way of looking at things. Then we're going to not segue very graciously into the eight year survey. And we're going to look at participation, the different types of uh, private and public landscapes that we have, the use of land, and then species status, and then end uh, with uh, Kevin giving an extensive uh, description of what we can do in our private yards to increase biodiversity. Okay, go ahead, Kevin. All right. I, do, All right. I assume everybody can see this, right? I can see it. That's helpful. I can see it better right now than I've seen okay. it all day. All right, good. Okay. Yeah. Um, two stories. The first one, the first picture on you, I talk in, in <clears throat> pictures. The first picture on your left is my home and when I was where I was born. And the inner picture, if you have it on your computer, not your phone, you will see buried back there on the hill, a little tiny house. And that was my house. And then in the picture in back of it is actually the picture of the house. It was a small house, four bedroom, four uh, rooms, et cetera. But the key is that first picture where it's completely buried. This was probably 1940, 1938 to 1940 when my father built this house. And he did it by blasting a hole in the ledge in, in this hill type of area and then building it there. The one, story from my past, from my childhood that I remember and I have it very clearly pictured in my mind where I was standing. It's like a Martin Luther King moment in time where you remember exactly where you were standing and what happened was snakes. And this is why I asked Sue Muller, Sue Muller when snakes actually emerge from their eggs or hatch from their eggs. I came into the house by the front door, which is usually where the black snake, the, I guess a rat snake, usually coiled up and just spent its time in facing the Eastern sun. And I came in and I heard this scream from the pantry and back of the kitchen. And then I see my mother with a broom and a whole mess. I mean, we're talking 20 plus, little baby snakes ahead of her going in all different directions. And she had the broom and she was sweeping the snakes across the kitchen floor and had me hold the front door open so she could continue to sweep them out of the house. They had emerged in the laundry basket in the uh, back. Clearly she had not ironed or dealt with that, that basket of laundry for quite a few uh, days, probably a couple months. So that's one image that I have. And I realized as I looked at my neighborhood, which is in the right-hand picture with density, suburban density, my lot is probably one fifth of an acre. The 2000, we are buried with houses around us. And so in the 1940s, our house was embedded in nature. We lived with nature. It was there, it visited us on a regular basis, in fact, all the time. And we were friends with nature. We never hurt the snakes. It was like, if you're sunning yourself on the front step, we'll go out the other door. But now what we have are hawks on the chimneys, as I call it. We had the red-shouldered hawk's nest in our neighbor's tree. And for six weeks, it maybe seemed like eight weeks, the baby hawks screamed from our chimneys. We only meet nature when it comes meandering through, makes a big ruckus. And even then, some of my neighbors didn't even know that there were hawks on their chimneys. Even when one came down and landed on the car 
their car, they didn't realize what it was at that point. So we have a completely different situation and our perspective of nature is completely changed. Once we lived with it, now it's not really part of our neighborhood. We go, and I use the word visit, obviously I'm visiting Florida, we go to visit nature. And it's like going to a restaurant or going to a museum. And we go there and then we set nature aside when we come back home again as a nice experience, one we feel good about. And when it does happen to come into our neighborhood in the form of a red-shouldered hawk and its babies, we, some of us are ecstatic and we run around with our cameras taking pictures. Some of us are fearful, like what is that up there? And some of us don't even know it's there. And so I have thought a lot about how do we get people to bring nature home? Talamy's title uh, of his book, how do we do this? How do we form a relationship again with nature or reform that relationship? I've done presentations where we talk about all the different types of plants that we can put in these elaborate gardens. I have one of those wild gardens myself. And it's a very scary thought for a lot of people. They're, um, they don't know what the plants are. They're afraid of getting something out of control. It's not something they're used to or they know about and they can mow and then forget about it or hire somebody to come in and mulch it and mow the lawn and forget about it. So I thought, well, let's take a look at small gardens. And so that's where all these things came together and why I'm talking about pocket habitats at this point. Okay, let's go to the next one, Kevin. You're Kevin. Right. Oh, yeah, I hear you. Hang on. <laughs> there you go. Okay, thank you. Ah. Oh, I've got some of my pretty pictures here. I can actually see them in color. I'm using my printed out notes here, uh, sitting on the bed. Okay, so what is a pocket habitat? I'm making this up. Okay, I'm not going to a book and trying to get something. This is my definition. And I'm defining it as any area smaller than what is typical in that particular area. All right, and it could be created or could occur naturally. Uh, it's part of a larger environment. And we're talking about butterflies or pollinators now. So it may support many butterfly species, a single species or none. Now, pictures are below are examples. Pocket gardens can be a bunch of pots of zinnias on your deck, okay? I cannot get a zinnia to grow in my garden. I have a sort of a seat. I cannot get anything that seems to be normal to grow in my garden, just native things. So I put all my zinnias on the deck and that forms a nice little habitat for all the monarchs who wanna come through in September when some of my other plants aren't blooming. The second picture over from the left is from Alicia Buxom's um, farm uh, up in Woodbine area. And this is a little tiny piece of actual garden between the garage and part of the house. It's just a little pocket. Whenever I go up there to look for butterflies, this is the first and last place I stop. And there are always interesting butterflies there. The next picture is just the standard garden. And I don't know where this one is from, which probably uh, West, West Side Garden Plots. Uh, with a bunch of um, uh, nectar plants for butterflies. We can also have pocket meadows, which on the right, far right-hand side, a daisy meadow is a good example of that. Pocket parks, any of the little tiny parks we have around. And this particular one, I think, is probably Atherton, uh, based on the large amount of flowers in the water management pond there. So I always know that I can go here and there's certain types of things that I will find in this park. So 
a pocket park can be almost a pocket habitat can be almost anything ranging in size from a few pots of zinnias or some kind of plants, um, milkweed, et cetera, up to a full park buried in, in something else. Not all gardens are a habitat. Um, down here in Florida, almost every single plant that I've identified so far is introduced or uh, a couple of them are also invasives. None of them, in the gardens have any kind of um, native background and will not support any kind of uh, fawn of, of uh, butterfly. So not all gardens are habitat, but a lawn can be a habitat with clover, violet, crabgrass, dandelion, the weeds still in it, they could become a habitat. Um, and Maryland, this is from Talamy's uh, book, which one? Uh, Nature's Best Hope. A 2005 study showed that Maryland had over 1.1 million acres of lawn, more than two times all of the state parks and natural areas put together. So there is room somewhere, possibly in your yard or your neighbor's yard for some kind of a little small area for some pocket habitat. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so applying this. This first one is from my neighborhood. The left-hand side has uh, David Alexander since he's here. I know David's, I think I heard David's voice earlier. Um, David's yard. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, you're there. You, you may be able to talk to this a little better, but I'm trying to be brief. All right, David has pockets of pollinator habitat, uh, flowering nectar habitat, and he has an interesting lawn. And he, his is an example, and I guess it's been used as an example by, uh, what is her name? I put her name. Uh, uh Vaya, yes. Dr. Saravaya, I put her name and her um, email in the chat box. Anyway, he has created a lawn that has clover and fine fescue in it. And this is because this is uh, a regenerative type of thing. The roots go deeper, et cetera. It's what I call a grass substitute. When you want your lawn to look like a lawn, there are ways of doing it without having to um, just uh, have turf grass. So his examples here show at least two different types of habitat that he has for butterflies on his property. On the right-hand side, bottom right, a neighbor had a situation where the trees were dying. They were uh, introduced cherry trees and some other types of bushes. All of them were dying. Uh, 30 years, and it was covered with English ivy and miscellaneous turf grass. And he decided he did not want any of that. So he did hire a native landscaper to come in, strip the ivy out of there, get rid of it, and create a native planting. So his yard is now going to be an entirely uh, native uh, flowering uh, pollinator, hopefully, type of area. My yard is in the middle and it has a swamp in the middle of it because there's a seat there and there's water and no lawn will grow anyway, but everything else lo it loves it. And then in the upper right hand corner is a neighbor on my left as you look at the chart. And they have a regular landscaper came in and just put a simple border in, but they specified that they did want some native and butterfly and pollinator attracting plants as part of this thing. Both of these neighbors are not interested at all in mowing lawn or in taking care of gardens. One of the issues that I think is happening is that people think of a, a native garden and they think, of, oh my God, I've, I have no idea what kind of plants to put in there. It's gonna look messy. 
there's going to be things in there, bees and bugs and stuff like that, that may be dangerous to my children. I won't have any place for my dog to play or my kids to play. And, and I'll have a lot of work for nothing. So instead of looking at it like I've got to redo my whole yard, look at pockets within the yard. Use a pocket habitat perspective and create little little areas of this. Now, the, the problem with this is these are isolated little pockets. However, if enough people get together, not necessarily because they coordinated it, because certainly our neighborhood did not coordinate anything. It just was all individuals. Uh, what you end up with is the start of a corridor. So we have butterflies now that I watch flip from my yard into the yard next to my left, hopefully back over into David's yard, hopefully flipping into the two yards. I've seen them cross the cul-de-sac and go over into the other yards. So we have, instead of now, little fifth and quarter acre pockets these pockets have now expanded into a one acre pocket. And if we get enough one acre pockets hooked together, we have a quarter. And this is the whole premise of Nature's Best Hope and Talamy's books, is that we bring this home and put all these little pockets together. Um, and it just happened that I realized this was happening in our, our area. Okay. Let's go to the next one. I've got to hurry through some of these or we'll never get done. Okay, a pocket habitat in a park. This is for people who don't have a lot of yard to deal with. I know that Clayton, for example, lives in a townhouse type of thing. And so, and it doesn't face the right direction for having sun and all that kind of stuff. So some people simply can't produce anything more than a very small little pocket, although people try. So when you're out walking about, the perspective I'm hoping people can develop is instead of just glancing at a park as a whole, that as you're walking along, you look and for pockets that might be uh, sustaining different types of uh, pollinators, butterflies. Uh, you certainly know the bird pockets if you're a birder. And quite often you probably go into a park and head straight toward the spot that you know is where you're going to find certain things. The areas where you are heading straight to are the pockets. I picked Warfields Pond Park because I've been there, because Bill Hill is been there a lot. Uh, a couple other people, Woody has been up there a lot. And it was interesting for the number of butterfly species that have been seen there versus the number of pocket habitats that are there. As you walk into the park nice. on the left, where the parking lot is, there is a meadow which has milkweed in it and sustains some of the bigger butterflies. You keep walking down the little path and there's mold area where there's a little drainage area and it's sort of a wet, grassy, clovery type of area. Good spot for skippers and little butterflies like blues. You head down to the dam and they did plant the earthen dam. And for a few years, they didn't actually mow it around the beginning of July. So there were actually flowers there and attractive to the pollinators and the butterflies. And we even saw Coral Hair Street there. So there is a potential and sometimes habitat for nectar right on the dam. Below the dam is a sedge wetland. This is a very important pocket habitat for Appalachian Brown and the sedge area is rare in Howard County. You cannot find that in very many places. This is an important habitat that needs to be preserved. You continue around the pond up to where the Warfields Pond Park sign is, and there's a wooded seepage area, wet 
uh, wooded area. Probably has some of the pearly eyes in there, uh, possibly some commas, et cetera. This has another group, uh, another particular pocket habitat. So as you walk, becoming aware of what there is there, what needs to be saved, where you might find specific things. And so all these butterflies you see in this picture were taken at Warfields Palm Park. Interestingly, you will not see all these butterflies at the same time as they all occur at different times through the year. So when you go there, you do not see 15 butterflies at one sweep. So you would think that this habitat is not diverse, but this is an example of an area that a pocket park, which has little pockets in it, uh, which create a background or a, to sustain diverse species. Okay, let's go through the next one. Linda, we really need to pick up the pace here. Yes, I told you this is gonna be not good. Um, anyway, at, uh, so we're breaking over to the survey and I'll run this fairly quickly. So this year, we've, uh, not this year, but through the survey, we've learned uh, these five things, basically that people are interested, that we have enough information to update the status of species, that information on skippers and rare species may be dependent on surveyor habitat location and identification skills, and that will come out through, as we go through this, and that private gardens are, uh, are extremely important to some survival of some of the species in our area and that we need to try to preserve specialized habitats on other areas. Okay, let's go to the next one, Kevin. Okay, uh, for this year, uh, three areas, the number of observers, surveyors, and duration were all way off the charts way above some of the preceding years. Also the number of butterflies we saw. The number of species we saw was down by one or two species from what we normally see, but well within the ballpark. A uh, couple, we have a couple new um, uh, butterflyers. Uh, Tyler, who was one of the, with his mom saw the last butterfly of the year. And Lowell, one of Kevin's nephews, right? Grandson. I guess. What? Grandson. 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 Okay, excuse me, grandson. So I featured them on, wanted to feature them on here with all the observers that we had this year because it's important that we get some of our youngsters out. Okay, next one. Highlights. Lots here. This is going to be uh, probably up on the website somewhere too, so people can get all this. And I think um, Kevin will include it in like the uh, summary of the year. So I'm not going to read all of this. Basically what we had, we had 13 species plus five, uh, 13 species that had the highest uh, counts and five species that had the lowest. And so there were more species this year that we had high counts than low ones. We had some of our low ones were the ones we've talked about last year, the great spangled, the dusted didn't appear again. Uh, slightly surprising, but not to me because I know why. The American copper and the common checkered skipper have gone down considerably. And that's because of habitat lost up in the woodbine area. Uh, Eastern Commons had a huge spring, silvery checker spots had, there was a huge eruption in one area and white M's were all over the place. Um, and we enjoyed the fact that Robinson and MPEA had uh, joined us this year and have two new initiatives. And we will publish all this stuff on the Bird Club website as we go into the spring. Okay, next one. Survey locations, I'm only gonna make one point about this chart. Look over on the right-hand side, this is 2021. And you'll notice that all the bars are more or less even. Actually, they're 31% of the surveys, et cetera, the location, excuse me, were in gardens, 30% were in the parks, and 38% were other areas, which is almost anything from power lines 
to storefronts, to water management ponds, gateway park, et cetera. Interestingly, if you combine the car garden and the other areas, that's 70% more or less of our survey is on private property. Private meaning not owned by the government and managed by the government. So a power line easement is a private easement. 86% of the land, according to Talamy's uh, uh, reference, of the land east of the Mississippi is in private hands. So we have 70% in our survey, 86% in his uh, reference is in private hands. This is why private gardens and private property is so important in trying to create habitat corridors. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Okay, uh, species diversity. These are detailed charts. Uh, and I'm only going to pick out a couple parts of this and then you can look down through the most uh, garden, the most species diversity is seen in the park, surprisingly, and then in the other, and then in the private gardens. But all of them are up there 60 some odd percent or higher, 78% in the park totals. The parks include Mount Pleasant, so which has the highest number in the county. All right, and then all these other ones down, heading down, had more than 40 of the 80 species that are possible to be seen in Howard County. Any park that is not listed on here, or any location that's not listed on here had less than half of the species that generally occur in a county. And we have some other charts that are indicating that. Now, part of this is skewed because any, it depends on who was looking at the particular areas, especially when you get to gardens, because a lot of people are still a little wary about their skippy, skipper identification. And since 20 of our species, actually 30 of our species are skippers that might be able to be seen around and 20 of them I think could occur in gardens. If you don't know the skippers, then they're not going to appear on the um, uh, list of people that uh, are turned in. It would be like a bird count and you see a bunch of the brown um, sparrows out there but you're not really sure which sparrow is which, you're not going to be able to report the particular sparrows. All right, so the issue here is that certain habitats um, need to, to be looked at. Well, there's three issues really. We need to identify and preserve some of the specialized habitats that, that have the different, more unusual species we need to provide nectar and host plants to areas that are lacking in diversity. So if a park did not appear on this chart, it means it doesn't have the habitat that could sustain the butterflies because it has less than 40 species there. Okay, private residential, this is our next one. Okay, now this is a breakout from the previous chart. All right, private residential landscapes include meadows, they include formal gardens like Kevin's, which is on the upper right, and they include specialized gardens like uh, David Ryan's Monarch Gardens. Not all gardens have to be diverse in their species. Some gardens are aimed specific, at a specific species or maybe a small group of uh, species. Some pocket habitats in the parks will be for maybe one species, like the juniper hair streak. There's at Centennial Park, there is a spa, a po pocket right near Route 108 that just has junipers in there. And that's all it's meant to have in there because the juniper hair streak needs that. We know that the monarchs need monarch way stations. They need a spot where they're going to have everything they need, which would be 
their milkweed and it will also mean in the fall some kind of nectar plants. I thought that David's garden plan that he has, he drew it from what he actually has, is a good example of how a specialized garden can be incorporated into the uh, garden that you have, the normal yard that you have. Uh, it was interesting that we had 18 gardens that had rare and unusual species. We know, all know about Barbara White's pipevine swallowtail garden. There are 12 different locations where we've seen them, but Barbara's had 96. If Barbara decides that she wants to move to Florida to retire or something, which hopefully she never does. Uh, any rate, if she decides to leave, somebody will probably come in there, redo her yard completely back into turf grass or something. And there goes the major source of pipevine swallowtail in the county. On the other hand, a hackberry tree has uh, which Kathy Litzinger has and Pat Greenwald has hackberry tree. And now Robinson Nature Center has hackberry trees and Mount Pleasant has hackberry trees. From that, we get five different species, diversity right from one tree. Because we have at least five and probably more locations where hackberry trees exist, those butterflies species are not in any kind of danger. Okay, let's go on from this. Okay, parks and wildlife management areas. This breaks out the parks. And by this point, I'm getting down to 30 species recorded. This is if they have over 30 species, that counts skippers and others. So if you look down through this and you can see the parks, you can see that these are the only ones I get down to 30. So and this is with a lot of surveys going through. So if a park isn't on this list, it means it doesn't really have a uh, habitat that is going to be conducive to butterflies. And that means we need to be doing something here. Okay, let's go. Okay, this is one of the great things this year. We didn't institute this. Other people instituted this. Two special projects are doing exactly what needs to be done in the parks. The MPEA survey, which had nine surveyors and a lot of surveys, found 39 species this year, but it was their first year trying uh, to do it. Set in Robinson Master Naturalist surveys, eight surveyors, and they had a very specific goal in mind. All right, Allie Rogan wrote exactly what needs to be done in different areas. My goal was to help Robinson attract and support a greater diversity of butterflies. Using the Howard County survey results from prior years, some research and talking with different butterfly aficionados, I put together a list of butterflies which could likely be encouraged at Robinson by adding specific additional host plants in suitable locations. They have the nectar there. That's exactly what needs to be done. And that's exactly what they were trying to do at MPEA. Okay, let's go. What's the next one? Okay, the only part on this one that I really want you to look at these are small pockets of diversity on. Uh, public and private, quote, other areas. The left is a uh, power line easement. It's at Elkhorn Gardens, west side garden plots, bottom left. Right, uh, a water management pond. And up at the top, a storefront garden. I was amazed when this is my hairdresser. I went over there and I started to see uh, ladies. Uh, painted ladies, uh, basically. And I suddenly realized I was standing on a sidewalk where every other storefront had turf grass, had lawn. And on either side of the pavement where I was standing were pollinator plots. 
perfect example of a pocket habitat. Okay, let's go on from there. Okay, here's an example of one that is being, that was put in. This is Howard Community College for the sustainability day. They were doing this. And the pictures along the bottom show the gully or the stream bed type. It really wasn't a stream. It's sort of a water shed, like it's a little brook screen, whatever, water area going along the parking lot, which they designed and then turned into pollinator habitat. While we were there, cloudless sulfur flew by. There was a question mark and other uh, bugs and beetles and bees uh, up on a tree where there was a sap run. I mean, this is a perfect example of what to do with an area along a parking lot. Okay, next one. I think that's it, Kevin. Okay, so let me take over here. Um, so we're, we're gonna switch into the results of this year for um, several slides and uh, give you a sense of what we can do with the data that we have after eight years worth of doing this. So comparing the eight year results pie chart for you know number of each species to the 2021 20, results, it's, it's pretty consistent. Um, of the top 14, 12 are the same in both cases. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Um, this, this year, cabbage white had over 6,000, which is the first time any butterfly um, exceeded 6,000 in a single year. So here is kind of a interesting chart about how we figure out how many butterfly species or how to, how to pretty much predict how many butterfly species we would get in a year. So the ones in green are, well, first of all, 61 of the 80 species in the survey have been found in all eight years. And if you assume that's going to continue, the ones in green have been found in six or seven of the years, and several of those have been found in the last six or seven years. And there's seven of those, so you, that's 68. So at a minimum, we should get around 68 species. And on the top end, you look at the ones in purple, we've only seen those six butterflies once each, and one butterfly each time. So highly unlikely we see them in any given year. And this one in tan, Dustin Skipper, we saw the first five years and haven't seen it since. And we think it's extirpated from the county. We're gonna keep looking, but we think that's the case. So there's seven butterflies so that drop out from 80 and you're at 73. So generally you figure between 68 and 73. And the, what makes or breaks that is these ones in yellow, which are Southern migrants, which show up some years and not others. And these ones in blue, which are um, butterflies that are just hard to find. So these are pictures of the 13 species of butterflies that had their high count uh, this year. Um, so really quickly, white M, red banded hair streak. Um, we had uh, northern broken dash, little glassy wing, hobo moak skipper, pair of zabba moak skippers, a dun, black swallowtail, cabbage white. Silver checker spot, Viceroy, Northern Pearly Eye, and Spring at, or Summer Azure. And as we said earlier, we had 13 with the highest count, 14 with the lowest count, 27 out of 69. That's close to 40%, which is really a good number. Um, so looking at Silver Checker Spot, really interesting situation here. So the highest count that we had in the first six years of the survey was 13. And in 2020, we had 32. We were ecstatic. We made it to Butterfly of the Year. We were so impressed that we had 32 of them. And this year we had 246. Um, Kathy Litzinger found 215 at a single location, Ilchester Elementary. She found 110 on a single day on Jerusalem Artichoke, a new host plant. Uh, so it really goes to show you that, you know, you can find things in here that we haven't seen before that really make a difference. Unfortunately, the area was obliterated in the past month and we're not sure the Jerusalem artichoke will even come back up. Not to mention that they moved the leaves and basically took the caterpillars out because this butterfly overwinters as a caterpillar. But the question is, how many different habitats, pocket of diversity like this, have we not found in Howard County yet? Um, one, one advantage of having this kind of data is you can start plotting year to year and you can see the year to year variations. These are six species that have significantly higher counts 
in 2021. So let's get to the species with the lowest annual count in eight years. So silver spotted skipper, um, it's dropped three years in a row, still could be year to year variation. We need, just need to keep an eye on this one. Cross line skipper always has low counts, almost for sure an ID issue. Um, even uh, you know those of us that do this really frequently have a hard time with this one. American copper has dropped five years in a row. Single location with large numbers may not have been surveyed is frequently eh, five years in a row. That's kind of a hard argument to make, but um, I'll show a graph about this later on. And great spangled is 20 to 25% of the numbers in 2018 for the last three years. Problem is not just local, could be global warming disrupting the timing of the caterpillar coming out of diapause versus the um, violets, which is what it uses for host plant emergence. Uh, the real place to go for looking for this one is Schooley Mill Park. And Broadwing Skipper will go in, this is our next chart, we'll take care of that one. So interesting story here. If you look at this middle chart, uh, we've never seen a lot of Broadwing Skippers. The, the highest we've seen in any year has been 11. Uh, we've seen 48 total in the eight years. So again, not, not a skipper that we see a lot of number, large numbers on. If you look at the left-hand chart uh, for where we've seen them, 35 of the 48 we've seen has been in Kathy Litzinger's garden. So that's a big deal. Um, and the other 13 we're seeing in, in over eight other locations. So if you look at who's seen them, of course, Kathy's seen most of them. She's seen 39 of the 48. And then you look at the lower right here and she hasn't seen any in her garden in 2020 or 2021. And the reason for that is broadwing skippers adapted to Phragmites as a host plant, which is really unusual because Phragmites are not native and not many butterflies take up host plants on non-native plants. Uh, there was a location of Phragmites near Kathy's house that was destroyed uh, between 2019 and 2020. And she hadn't seen them since basically. And that was the place to see them in the county. The other loca eight locations have produced 13 broadwing skippers in eight years. So the question is, are there any other locations out there like Kathy's where we're just not seeing the broadwing skippers yet. This is also somewhat of an ID issue. It's not, not a trivial one to recognize. So moving on, here's the graph of the American copper. In 2016, we had 86 of them, and every year it's dropped since then. So in 2021, we only had 12. Uh, so that's concerning. And common checkered skipper, similar story, maybe not quite as bad. It's dropped four years in a row, uh, but it dropped from you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 330 down to about 25. So a significant drop on this one as well, something we need to keep an eye on. So one of the other things that we can look at um, with the data we have is when these things are out. Um, and one question I always had, Linda always said that if you see an angle wing you know, in the late winter on a warm day, it's almost definitely a comma. I was wondering where she got that information from. So we just plotted. You know, what we saw when we see commas, when we see question marks over, over time, and it's absolutely correct. Um, there's a big peak of commas in early to mid-March where question marks are significantly lower. And it turns out that question marks, some question marks migrate south for the winter and some stay. Um, so commas had a, a, a huge year this year. We had 21 total for the year last year. And this year we had 79 total and we equaled last year's by mid-April. Um, so they had a huge spring. Um, each of the three butterflies that overwinter as an adult, uh, comma, question mark, morning cloak, had the second highest number of sightings in the survey this year. So again, the other thing you can look at is species variability year to year. Um, you get a sense like Painted Lady 2017 was a big migration year. Meadow Frit in 2015 was an eruption year. Um, and you can see Car Sleepy Orange, for example, it's just going up and up and up. Basically, it's a southern migrant that's becoming more common as the weather warms. And this year, Robinson Nature Center, which is one of the two main places to see it, took out much of their center. So we lost a bunch of them from that. Um, and again, you can, you can compare like species with, with the data we have. So, you know, American lady, if you're going to see it in May, it's probably going to be an American, not a painted. If you're going to look at it in October, it's almost for sure going to be a painted more than an American. Um, you can look at, uh, you know, Littlewood Seder here, 
uh, single, single brood in uh, late May, early June, mid, up to mid-June, very high peak. And then you look at Northern Pearly Eye, which has two broods. You, you'll see a little one during the same time you see the little wood satyr. And then by, by the time you get to, uh, you know, late summer, early fall, you're almost for sure seeing a Northern Pearly Eye. Appalachian Brown has two broods, but they're also in a very, you know, they, they have to, a wet area that people don't normally get to. So these are probably being undercounted, but they're nowhere near as common as either of the other two in that list. So I'm going to change gears here and talk about what we can do at home to help butterflies. Um, part of this is uh, what we're doing in Bee City as well. Um, just for everybody who doesn't know, Howard County joined Bee City in September of 2019. Uh, Bee City is a program by the Xerxes Society that tries to get people to plant pollinator gardens to help bees and butterflies, uh, both of which are dropping uh, drastically. They're like 30% of what they were decades ago. So one of the things we can do is plant a pollinator garden. And some tools to help with that are uh, the Bee City folks put together six templates, um, depending on sun and soil wetness. Um, They're all located on the Howard County Bird Club website and on the Bee City website at livegreenhoward.org. <laughs> Um, so these will help start, they have, you know, eight or nine or, uh, different samples of plants that you can use for each condition. And on the back of this are backup coins as well. So a very useful thing. If you're going to get started, you want to decide what to use, starting with the power pollinator plant families is not a bad way to go. Um, there's also a pollinator plant spreadsheet that's both on both the Howard County Bird Club website and Live Green Howard. Um, this is one that has 125 herbaceous plants, 20 trees and shrubs, six vines, 11 grasses, lots of reference information and notes. And really importantly, it can be sorted to emphasize what your need is. So it's a really good tool to use if you have a sunny, moist uh, plot that you want to look for plants for. You can just sort on you know, sun and moist and whatever time of year you want or whatever else you want to sort on and it'll pop up what, what you can plant. So the second thing is the landscape for caterpillars. Um, this is really important because you get caterpillars, you get butterflies. Also, if you get caterpillars, you get birds. There's a single pair of breeding chickadees must find six to 9,000 caterpillars to rear a single clutch of young. And that's just to get it out of the nest. And they feed it for several weeks afterwards. So you can add a few thousand to that for each brood. So consider planting keystone trees, shrubs, and plants. And you can see the next slide for that because not all native plants are the same in terms of their ability to feed caterpillars. And consider planting host plants of the survey butterflies. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but some of these you get real bang for the buck here. So purple grass, there are six different species that use it for host plant. Hackberry tree, there's five. Uh, blue, little blue stem, there's five or four. Um, violets do all the fritillaries, et cetera. You get the idea. Um, by the way, this PowerPoint will be posted on the Howard County Bird Club website. So no need to take notes. You can just download the PowerPoint afterwards. And this is all being videoed as well. So here are the keystone trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants that uh, Doug Tallamy uh, put together. Um, you can see that oaks are the big one at 534 species. Um, and basically, Keep in mind trees and shrubs because they are all the top numbers on this column. They're all trees and shrubs in the left-hand column. And then you get the herbaceous plants in the right-hand column. So the, the lowest number of butterfly or plant species in the trees and shrubs is 125. The highest number in herbaceous plants is 115. So keep that in mind when you're, don't, or don't forget at least the trees and shrubs when you're planting out your, uh, you know, your um, garden and your, uh, you know, you're basically your, your whole yard. So the next one up is leave the leaves, something that I wasn't aware of until maybe a couple of years ago. Um, we've looked at overwinning strategies of the 80 species of butterflies. We haven't got, quite gotten through it, but there's at least 57 of them that overwinter in the egg, caterpillar, or chrysalis stages. And most of them overwinter in the leaves. So birds and butterflies, or butterflies and bees have to bridge the fall to the spring successfully to thrive. And leaving the leaves and stalks is just one is it, it just as important as planting and nurturing the natives. 
Leaves aren't litter, they're food, they're shelter for the butterflies, bees, moths, and more. So preliminary results from a University of Maryland study show that the number of emerging moths and butterflies are reduced by about 67% in areas where leaves are removed. So you get three times as many butterflies and moths if you leave the leaves. Just something to think about. Mm -hmm. You tend your garden, you avoid pesticides, you give them flowers and place the nest, and then you throw them out when you, when you, when you get rid of the leaves, the, the butterflies that you work so hard to attract. And the leaves also provide mulch and additional insulation against the bitter cold weather that can protect newly planted perennials. So lawns, how can we do better? Um, everybody's heard of this, so I'll make it quick. They're monocultures, they're a biological desert. They're the largest irrigated crop in the United States. And they now occupy 45.7 million acres or three times the size of New Jersey. Lawn irrigation on the East Coast accounts for 30% of the water use. We use 600 million gallons of gasoline every year in lawn maintenance. So, and one hour of grass cutting equals 100 miles worth of auto pollution. Um, Lawn care requires chemicals, chemical pollutants and toxins that end up our streams and waterways. Fish and aquatic life are poisoned and kills. And 40 to 60% of fertilizers ends up in our surface and groundwater, contaminating them with extra nu nu nutrients. So what can we do about that? So we can mow less frequently. Mow it every two to three weeks. Leave the weeds. The study, recent study explored the effect of different lawn um, mowing frequencies. Lawn mowed every other week. Bee abundance increased. Lawns mowed every three weeks, twice the number of flowers, increased bee diversity, slightly lower bee abundance numbers versus the every other week strategy. Mow height not less than three and a half inches. Mow part of your lawn. One of the other things is just mow part of your lawn, rotate it. So you mow part one week and then rope, or and then two weeks later or three weeks later, mow the other part. So you've got some that's higher with more flowers and some that's lower. Um, and you just keep rotating it back and forth that way. But ultimately, if you can do it, it's reduce the size of your lawn by converting it to a pollinator garden, a meadow or ground cover a little bit at a time. And each of these will result in less water, gasoline, chemical usage time, mm -hmm. more flowers, bees and butterflies. So many of you live in areas that have homeowners associations and you're, gonna, and you're saying, there's no way they'd let us do that. So I want to point you to Maryland uh, House Bill 322 that went into effect at the beginning of October. And it law codifies the right to have pollinator habitat gardens and specifically encourages attracting wildlife and pollinators. And the law says the HOAs cannot require homeowners to plant turf grass and may not impose or act to impose unreasonable limitations on low impact landscaping. And here they define low impact landscaping you know, biohabitat gardens and other features to attract wildlife, pollinator gardens, and other features designed to attract pollinator species, et cetera, rain gardens, xeriscaping, et cetera. So this particular Maryland Homeowners Association, um, actually it was in Howard County, spent $100,000 trying to destroy this garden, this pollinator garden, and the homeowners, Janet and Jeff Crouch fought back saved their garden and inspired the passage of this state law in the process. And Janet is Nancy Lawson's sister. Nancy's the author of um, the- uh, Humane Janet, Gardener. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> it's an <laughs> awesome book. And if you've ever had a chance to read it, I highly recommend it. I knew I'd blank somewhere along here. Mm -hmm. All right, and the last one is re reduce mosquito spray and insecticide usage. Um, the, basically, the insecticides and, and mosquito spray basically kill all insects, not just mosquitoes. So fireflies, butterflies, bees, beetles, true bugs, moths, dragonflies, etc. The companies claim that these are similar to naturally occurring substances and chrysanthemums, which is true, but they're more toxic and they last longer in the environment and they typically respray every three weeks. So what can you do as an alternative? You can regularly remove or drain sources of standing water. Mm -hmm. You can use BTI mosquito dunks, naturally occurring bacterium found in soils that specifically target and only affect the larva of mosquito, black fly, and the fungus gnat that are in the standing water. Using repellents containing DEET and wearing long sleeves. For, for some people, a mosquito-free yard is worth the cost of some bike hill, but you should at least be informed of the potential costs as well as the benefits. Okay, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one, so I wanted to shout out to B-City, 
uh, was we Howard County joined it in September 2019. A lot of what they're trying to do is exactly what we're trying to do in the Butterfly Survey and the Bird Club. Um, I'm going to shout out to a couple of these. Uh, they, we, there was a talk by Doug Tallamy and by Heather Holm last year that the Bird Club funded 50% of. They also uh, we also um, contributed $200 to the Pollinator Garden at Howard Community College. There is a ton of really good information here. That's at Live Green Howard. Um, if you look that up, um, great place. Lots of templates. Um, we you know we've hosted events during Pollinator Week. It's in late June. So keep an eye out for that. We've done giveaways for native plant giveaways and trees for bees giveaways, et cetera. There's a bunch of really good stuff. There's a couple of meadow installations that were done in Rockburn and Belmont to seven and a half acres of pollinator area. So information that we plan to make available, um, flight time diagrams like this one for the juniper hair streak, early and late dates that we're starting on, um, and for each of the species that we've seen. Um, overwintering strategies up here for you know, the eggs, caterpillars, and chrysalis. We're a long way through that. There's a few butterflies that migrate from the south, and I'm trying to figure out whether they stay um, and die and then have to get you know, re-filled uh, in from the south the following spring, or whether they migrate back south again. So we're trying to work out some of those issues. Uh, we're going to update host plant information. And hopefully, if we get a chance, we will update the butterflies of Howard County uh, that Dick Smith has done in 1993, 2000, 2012, and the latest was 2016, just before he passed away. So most years I put in photos from participants, and we got a ton of photos this year, and they were good ones. So thank you so much for that. And I'm putting up some of these if your photo's not here. Um, I apologize, I just could not put them all up. But uh, if you look at some of these, you know, three different species on one flower from, from Clayton, mm -hmm. great hobo oak skipper from Annette, long-tailed from Linda, and uh, a common checkered skipper from Karen Blum. Um, this red-banded hair streak from Annette is just stunning. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> a pair of pipevine swallowtails in my garden. A um, couple from Jim Wilkinson, falcate orange streak clouded skipper. Um, variegated fruit from Susan Tucker, another person who's fairly new to the survey, a black swallowtail from Ann Russo Heron, another newbie. Um, Heidi Osterman had a really nice monarch picture. And this is the only time I talk about monarchs in this talk. So uh, they actually had, actually had a decent year, to, you know, pretty average year, but pretty good overall. And then this is an interesting one. The banded hair streak found on uh, July 21st. I frankly did not believe this one. I, I questioned Grazina and Mike and said, there's no way. I, that's three weeks later than the, the, the previous late date. And then they sent me a photo to prove that they were right. So you just never know. Pictures. Yep. Thank you. So we got uh, a Viceroy from Aaron Russo Heron here, another great gray hair streak from Bill. A couple of Kelsey's shots of a dusky moon species in question mark. Uh, a Carlos Skipper from Clayton who sends in a ton of really good photos. Pipe farm from Kathy, Painted Lady from Annette, uh, Eastern Tail Blue from Linda, mm -hmm. and you know, a phenomenal morning cloak from Annette, and an app, app brown from Bill, and a juvenile's dusky one from Bill Hill that it shows these two spots, which really is what you need to look at to confirm its ID. Um, you get a harvester from Annette, a really tough butterfly to see, and a couple of interesting caterpillars, both of which are cloudless sulfur. There's two different coloration forms and Annette found both of them, I believe at Mount Pleasant. Mm -hmm. So I had actually put in some, uh, you know, caterpillar and chrysalis photos here because we got so many of those. So Annette also found a sleepy orange uh, on Senna at Mount Pleasant. This was a snowberry clear wing on coral honeysuckle in my garden. Um, a sleepy orange that is about to be closed from its chrysalis. You can see the butterfly inside the chrysalis has turned clear. Mm -hmm. and it was within a day of coming out. Here's one that just came out from Kathy's garden. Just an awesome photo from Bonnie of hackberry emperor eggs, eggs. and caterpillars. Wow. Uh, morning cloak coming out of a chrysalis uh, in Kathy's yard. She found them uh, overpositing on her hackberry tree. Uh, pipevine swallowtail, of course, from Barbara White's garden, the pipevine central in, in the county. I had question marks on my false nettle that I just planted this year and a variegated fritillary chrysalis, which is just stunning. I had four of them in the yard this year and they like um, uh, the um, violets. 
So we also got a couple of really neat videos here. So this is from Kristen. She had a bunch of black swallowtail caterpillars for a while, and then all of a sudden, there were a lot of them were missing. And she managed to take this video to figure out what was causing that. This is a tree frog, and this is a black swallowtail caterpillar. He certainly enjoyed that meal. Yes, he did. And this one is an awesome video of a harvester caterpillar eating aphids by Annette Allure. Harvester caterpillar is the only, um, you know, basically butterfly that is um, carnivorous. Thank you. <laughs> carnivorous. Carnivorous. Okay. Yes. Sweet, they can hear you when you talk. Okay. So, I mean, how cool is this? All right, one other example of uh, pocket habitat uh, is a northern pearly eye on Linda's dog, Lila. Just had to throw that in. All right, so first butterfly of the year this year, um, March 9th. Uh, first of all, I have a graph here of the dates of the first butterfly of the year of the eight years of the survey. So uh, this year, our first one was on March 9th. This question mark was found and photographed by Eric Metzman at MPEA. Um, we also had an Eastern comma by Steve Luke at River Hill High School the same day. And Bonnie Ott had an un unidentified angle wing at Henryton the same day. And the following day on March 10th, we had seven Eastern commas. So there were two warm days in a row and the commas took advantage of it. Um, the uh, angle wings flying can be difficult to ID as to whether it's a comma or a question mark. So all these sightings are the earliest identified butterflies. So the earliest unidentified angle wing that's been seen in the eight years of the survey was on January 12th of 2020 by Bonnie Ott, of course, at Alpha Ridge. So today's date being January 13th, I'd advise keeping your eyes open each warm day from now on because you could see one. Okay, Lindy, you want me to take this on or finish it or what? Yeah, you finish. Okay, so last butterfly of the year contest. Um, orange sulfur found by Amy and Tyler Dugas. Um, and uh, these are the runner up sightings. Basically, it was awesome find by these guys. Um, and they will get a Butterflies of the Mid-Atlantic book. So this whole program was um, suggested by Annette Allure, and she's the one who's buying the book and sending it out. So I, I give her kudos for doing that. But I give everybody who participated in this kudos for participating in it. And congrats to Amy and Tyler. It was awesome find. Uh, awesome find. You don't often see butterflies in December. And so it's cool, very cool. And the butterfly of the year, we do this every year. So um, white M's were just everywhere this year. The highest we've had in the first seven years was seven in any given year. And this year we had 24. And there are two broods, one in the spring, one in the fall. There was only a single butterfly seen in the spring and the other 23 were in the fall. And it felt like almost every day, someone was seeing a white M there for a while. So clearly earned the, uh, the butterfly of the year uh, mantra on this one. So embrace the wild in your garden. Your yard will be an oasis for bees, butterflies, and birds in your neighborhood. Register your garden with Bee City and receive this sign. They, they made 200 of them and they're willing to make more if you need them. And it's really good. It's, it's a metal sign so it holds up outside. Report your butterfly sightings to the butterfly survey and then sit back and enjoy the show. So thank you volunteers. That was great, Kevin and Linda. Thank you so much. That was amazing.
love seeing all the pictures and hearing all about it. Um, I'm sure plenty of people have some questions. So um, if you, if anyone wants to ask any questions, please unmute and speak up. Okay, I unmuted. I just want to tell them every year their talk is better than the year before. <laughs> Progression. Thank you. Yes, that was very good. It's so nice having this data and being able to use it. Um, I'd, I'd love to know why some of the numbers are coming out the way they're coming. Um, but at least we have the numbers to go with. So it, it's very cool. Uh, Allison wants to know, where do I add butterflies I saw to the butterfly survey? Um, yeah, good question, Allison. So if you go to the Howard County Bird Club website and you go to natural history butterflies, there is a incidental butterfly report form there. So as you see butterflies, you count what species and how many, and then you put it in a form along with some other information like, you know, the date, the uh, number of uh, minutes that you spent uh, looking and um, the uh, temperatures and cloud and all that kind of thing. So it's very easy to do. Um, and once you find out where it is, it's very easy to pick up and use. Thank you. Surely there are more questions. I just had a quick question. Um, I was just looking at one of the pictures you took and you, was that a snowberry clear wing caterpillar? Yes, it was. I was looking at that. And I'm like, oh, that looks like um, a tomato hornworm caterpillar. Yeah, yeah. No, it's snowberry clear wing. I, I go, oh no, I hope, I mean, mine were on tomato. So I'm guessing the yeah, ones I plucked yeah. off were uh, tomato hornworms. But. Yeah, this is on coral honeysuckle and that's one of its host plants. Okay. I, it, um, this is Susan Tucker. I wanted to thank Linda and Kevin for spending so much time helping me um, figure out what butterflies I had from pictures that I took. Oh, and yeah. especially, especially Linda with the skippers, which I still don't get. But anyway, thank you. Hey, we're happy to do that. And, you know, next year, as you see things that you don't recognize, send us a photo. Right. Hey, Kevin, I'm sending you an email. I'm not going to commit it here, but uh, I think the Atlas is going to be suffering this year in my block because, uh, damn it, I got to see more butterflies. <laughs> Good to hear, I think, Kurt. Get out there and look. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add, uh, Chris, and that, that tree frog video was great. <laughs> it wasn't that awesome. Yeah, that was cool. That was its uh, third caterpillar that I think it was eating. And then it ate another one after I took that video. I just, it boggles my mind that a small tree frog is able to eat that many caterpillars at yeah. once. Yeah. I'd never even heard of that. <laughs> I but, know, I remember asking you and you said, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so anybody that wants to have a video on next year's talk, you know, keep it to like 40 seconds or less and we will look at it. It's uh because we can't we can't run the really long videos that doesn't doesn't work with a, a talk that's limited time wise. Uh, but if you can keep it down to 40 seconds, and I think both of those were in that in that neighborhood, uh, we will certainly try to include it. I got I got some nice white M's over at uh, Robinson uh, that I think might be superior to the ones you have. If you want me to send them along, Kevin, I can do that. Sure. And uh, uh, Kathy, uh, I'm in a new house, so I'm going to be hanging up my sheet and see what happens here in terms of mods. Well, I have a question. How long is the butterfly survey for? Is this is if this is for eight years? How long does it go on for? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> as long as we as want, right? As long as people are willing yeah. to help. It, it's okay. it's year to year at this point. Sherry, it's year to year, so it, it depends. Okay. Is there going to be like a Howard County Butterfly Atlas uh, published or anything? Or? No. Yeah. I doubt it. Summary maybe for each year. Yeah. Ooh, All right. Any other questions? Anything in the chat? 
I just want to thank Linda for sending out the emails that I was even aware of the last butterfly of the year contest because <laughs> I would have never have known it, but I check out the butterfly emails that come out and I saw it in there. And then my son had a day off from school and we were walking the lake and he's like, look at that. And I'm like running over there with my camera looking crazy. <laughs> <'Cause they're> like, <laughs> we, have a, we have a potential winner here. So it was a lot of fun for him and I to experience that, but it was thanks to her email. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Linda's great at those emails. She's amazing. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Kevin and Linda. Yeah, thank you so much, Kevin and Linda. That was a great presentation. Yeah, excellent talk. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, thank you all. Thank you.